All right, welcome to tonight's meeting. We are now convening first for a limited formal meeting as the Board of Canvassers, which means that this is not a standard formal meeting and there's no general comment section. The agenda has, but there is in a separate meeting that it will happen right after this. Um, the agenda only has one new business agenda item regarding a resolution ca canvassing accepting and approving the results of the municipal general election held in Salt Lake City, Utah on November 21st, 2023. As the city's elected officials and as per state law, the Board of Canvassers for Municipal Elections includes the City Council and the Mayor. Therefore, a quorum and a simple majority consists of five board members. Certified vote totals are shown on the election results report. We have no public hearings, potential action items, comments, um, but we do have new business. So we are moving on to item E1, which is uh, regarding a resolution for the canvas of the Salt Lake City Municipal General Election of 2023. I will look for a motion. Oh, I will not. Cindy Lou will do something. Hi, Cindy Lou. Uh oh. <laughs> she has to go back and turn on the microphone for herself. We ask too much of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Cindy Lou Trishman, the city recorder, and the Salt Lake City contracts with the county for election management. And today we need to read the results of the election from 2023. For everyone to hear, we have copies of the precinct data and all of the ballot data. Following the canvas, the results will be certified per your resolution. So I just need to read the numbers that were provided. In the 2023 municipal general election, there were 96,285 active registered voters in Salt Lake City. 44,790 ballots were cast with a breakdown of method in the attached canvas statistics provided in the memorandum. The total percentage of turnout was 46.5%. As the city participated in ranked choice voting through the Municipal Alternative Voting Pilot Project, the numbers I am providing are representative of the two candidates listed in the final phase. For Salt Lake City Mayor, Rocky Anderson received 15,301 votes Aaron Mendenhall received 25,958 votes. Aaron Mendenhall is the duly elected mayor. For City Council District 2, Alejandro Alepoy ran unopposed, receiving 2,138 votes. And Alejandro Alepoy is the duly elected District 2 council member. For City Council District 4, Ana Valdemoros received 2,100 votes. Ava Lopez Chavez received 2,427 votes. Ava Lopez Chavez is the duly elected District 4 Council member. For City Council District 6, Tamor B. Simon Simnani received 3,682 votes. Dan Dugan received 4,695 votes. Dan Dugan is the duly elected District 6 Council member. And for City Council District 7, a two year term, Molly Jones received 3,794 votes. Sarah Young received 4,139 votes. Sarah Young is the duly elected District 7 Council Member. Newly elected officials will be provided certificates of election following the adoption of the Board of Canvassers Resolution, which certify these results. We do have copies of the memorandum and the election statistics at the recorder's desk over here. And that is all I need beyond for me. Thank you, City Recorder Cindy Lee Trishman. Now I will look for a motion. Chair, I move that the Board of Canvassers adopt the proposed resolution certifying, accepting, and approving the results of the Municipal General Election Mayor, City Council Districts 2, 4, 6, and 7 held in Salt Lake City, Utah, November 21st, 2023. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Valdemoros and a second from Council Member Wharton. Is there any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Do I need a roll call? 
No, I do not need a roll call. I just wanted to make a clarifying point for the public. All elected officials are sworn into office on January 2nd. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the swearing in ceremony will be January 2nd. So that motion passes seven to zero with Mayor Mendenhall being absent. <laughs> oh, did Rachel vote? Okay, eight to zero. <laughs> I didn't realize that was possible. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Rachel. <laughs> could, couldn't have done it without um, you. This concludes our board, our limited board of canvassers meeting. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Dan. Um, oh, is there a motion to adjourn the board of canvassers <laughs> meeting? Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn the board of municipal canvassers. Second. second. Is there a second? Okay, motion from... I get board member Dugan, a second from board member Petro. Any discussion to this motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That passes eight to zero. Okay, this concludes our limited board of canvassers meeting, and this meeting now stands adjourned. But don't go anywhere because we are now in today's formal city council meeting and we are happy to have you here whether in person on zoom or by watching on one of our live feeds we hope you'll continue to join us in whichever manner you feel most comfortable thank you for participating our first item on our agenda is the pledge of allegiance so please stand and join me in the pledge of allegiance i, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you again to everyone who is joining us tonight. Uh, before we move through the agenda, as always, I'll mention and remind everyone about our rules of decorum, which are in place to ensure our meetings move along well and to help everyone feel comfortable sharing their comments. A copy of the full rules are available at the door. Or our staff will, and our staff will post the link in Zoom for those joining on the Zoom. But please be respectful of all comment, all commenters, uh, no applause or cheers, etc. Um, so this brings us to item A4, which is approval of the work session meeting minutes of October seventeenth, twenty twenty-three. I will look for a motion. Move look for approval. Second. Um, okay, a motion from Council Member Pui. Second. From Dugan, I'll say. Um, any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That passes unanimously. Uh, okay. This now brings us to our, the public hearing section of our agenda. So if you would like to comment on any of the public hearings, we are accepting comments in person and online via Zoom. If you need to speak with our staff member, please select Achintia Mahajun from the list of participants. If you need to, you can also raise your hand in the Zoom window to indicate that you need something from the host. If you're here in the audience, you can raise your hand or uh, speak with any of our staff members who are over here on this side. Um, Taylor Hill on our staff will be calling the names of those who wish to comment based on the order we received the names or receive comment cards in hand. If you are on Zoom, please unmute your mic when Taylor calls your name. So our first public hearing is item B1, and that is about an ordinance to rezone uh, the property at approximately 1380 South, 900 West. Before we take public comments, I will ask Brian Fulmer, one of our council, policies, council staff policy analysts, to give a short introduction of this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal to rezone the properties at 1380 South 900 West and 1361 and 1376 South 1000 West from their current R1 7000 or single family residential zoning district to RMF 30 or low density multifamily residential. The petitioner owns the 1380 South 900 West parcel and their stated intent is to construct for sale four bedroom townhomes on the parcel. The other parcels are adjacent and under separate ownership. 
That owner has to be included in the zoning map amendment request to enable flexibility for potential development on those parcels. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Taylor, please start with our first public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have two people registered to speak to this item. The first will be Cameron Williams, followed by Albert S. Lee Barlow. Cameron is here in person. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I uh, I didn't know I was going to speak. I just wanted to leave a comment on the paper, but okay, great. Did you leave a comment yeah, card? I left a few sheets of paper. All right, uh, the staff will have that and that'll be included in the public record. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the second commenter. Next will be Albert S. Lee Barlow, who's here in person. Council. Um, I've spent a little bit of time getting to know my neighbors and have... Could you speak a little closer to the microphone? Sorry, thank that you. Is that better? Okay. And I've come to find out that the community as a whole that is adjacent to this proposed development is immensely against it. It's unique in the fact that so many people's backyards abut to this. And every single person that I've spoken to next to it that owns the home and has been there for a long time is vehemently against it. They're saying heck no. So that is something to take into consideration Multifamily housing in that particular area doesn't fit the identity of the neighborhood whatsoever. I think Cameron agreed with me on that. There was a lot of people that couldn't make it today that hold the exact same sentiment. Um, aside from that, I think it's, it's carelessly optimistic, a little bit foolishly overzealous to think that you're going to insert this type of housing in the middle of what is kind of an old growth community. So. There's a lot to consider here, and I think, um, you know, an analysis of the impact of this type of development will have hasn't been thoroughly looked over. So I think, don't be quick to say yes to something that might not be the, the best idea. So with that in consideration, I hope you guys will vote nay, or at least uh, take your time before granting this amendment. That's all. All right, thank you for your comment. Is there anyone in, in the audience or online that did not register but would like to speak to this item? Okay, please come to the front and state your name for the record. Name is Nephi Wayman. Thank you, Chair and Council, for the opportunity to speak. I am speaking in opposition to this proposed ordinance uh, rezone uh, for the, some of the same reasons as Albert did, as well as uh, there's a real parking issue there uh, going down those streets. There's no parking on Ninth West. I don't know if there's going to be provisions for parking on the new development, but it's already a mess. It's already not safe for the school kids that are going by right there every morning. And every afternoon and I don't think it's a suitable use of that space for the neighborhood as some of the reasons that Albert has already suggested so I'm voting in opposition to that as far as that goes thank you thank you is there anyone else that wishes to speak okay seeing none I will close the public hearing for item b1 um, oh wait, I need a motion to do that. Mr. Chair, yes. I move that the council close the public hearing and uh, defer action to a future council meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Motion from council member Dugan, second from council member Petro to close the public hearing and defer action. Is there any discussion to this item? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That passes unanimously. We will take action at a future meeting. Item B2 is an ordinance regarding a rezone at 680 South Gladiola Street. Uh, Brian Fulmer, again, our, one of our council staff policy analysts, will give us a brief introduction before taking public comment. 
This is a proposal to rezone the property from its current M2 or heavy manufacturing district to M1 or light manufacturing. The vacant parcel is triangular shaped and a little less than five acres. The petitioner's stated intent for the proposed rezone is to enable the property for a, to be used for a commercial truck driving school, which is permitted under M1 zoning, but not in M2. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Taylor, please start with our first comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is no one registered to speak to this item. All right, is anybody here in person or online that did not register but would like to speak to item B2? Okay, seeing none, I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that the council close the public hearing and adopt the ordinance. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, the motion is from Councilmember Pui. I'm gonna say Councilmember Wharton this time. And the motion was to close the public hearing and adopt the ordinance. Is there any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion passes unanimously. We are now on item B3, which is an ordinance uh, regarding a rezone and master plan amendment at 711 South and 721 South, 1200 East. Ryan Fulmer, take it away. Thank you. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map for the properties you referenced from their current R2, which is single two-family residential zoning, to I, or institutional zoning. In addition, the proposal calls for amending the Central Community Master Plan future land use designations from low density residential to institutional. The proposed amendments would allow expansion of the McGillis School Campus for classes, meetings, assemblies, and administration. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Taylor, please start with our first comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are four people registered to speak to this item. The first will be Joel Briscoe, followed by Christina Robb, and then Arla Funk. Joel is here in person. Hello. Welcome, City Council. I was on the school board years ago when the Salt Lake City School District declared the Douglas Elementary School surplus. It is we received two offers for the property as the school board. One of them was from a company that wanted to create a skilled nursing facility on the property, and the other was from the group that turned it into the McGillis School. Because this was my neighborhood, my kids played on the playground, we people walked dogs through frisbees, flew kites, and on the green space, I walked the neighborhood and I asked people what, which of those two alternatives they preferred. To a person, they indicated that they would like to see it remain a school. I'm encouraging you to act favorably on the rezone and on the master plan amendment tonight so that McGill School does not lose the opportunity to uh, acquire and make this transition. When I read the reports from staff, I have to tell you it warmed my heart to think of children walking the streets of my neighborhood half a block from the current McGill as to what would be their new camp, their new smaller campus. The only people I can think of who might possibly be somewhat dismayed are a handful of East High students who have used behind the building for a respite from their academic endeavors at East High. <laughs> and quite frankly, it would be good for them to be disrupted in that fashion. Um, this is a positive and it would do what city staff have told you, which is I think it would knit the community, the neighborhood, and McGillis more closely together, and I encourage your positive action. Thank you. Next will be Christina Robb, followed by Arla Funk, and then Kathy Scott. Christina's here in person. Hello, Council. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm happy to see you. I am Christina Robb, and I'm a resident of 1200 East. I have lived in this area for 30 years, and I also serve as the chair of East Liberty Park Community Organization. Um, we are right close to the boundaries at 8 South on this project, and um, we love the McGillis School. Um, we are here tonight because after the planning commission meeting, there were some concerns regarding parking in the area where my long-term neighbors and friends 
um, felt like they weren't being heard and came to speak to me as a community member. Um, but we wanted to put on the public record tonight that we did hear them um, when they said, an expansion of the zoning district is proposed. The city requires a traffic and parking study along with the application. Um, because the McGillis School believed that using the church building as a school will not significantly impact traffic or parking, that this was waived. So um, we want to make sure that you know we have spoke, spoke with many of those residents who in no way want to hold up this rezone of the McGillis School and to thank Councilman Mono and um, the Transportation Division for working on addressing something, some of the parking issues in the neighborhood after you hopefully vote to rezone this property this evening. Thank you. Next will be Arla Funk, followed by Kathy Scott. Arla's here in person. Good evening. I too am in favor of this particular proposal. Uh, the neighborhood's been concerned about what the use of this site would be. And McGillis has provided a, a plan which will prevent demolition of the building, which are certainly I think is a positive. Um, and they are, in my opinion, uh, a stable and long-term tenant, and they have proved their value to the neighborhood with their property on 13th East. Uh, they have been there for many years now. The property is well-maintained, and the school has um, been concerned with the neighborhood and has helped in every way that they could to work with the neighborhood. Um, they have been using the property for the past year. There will be no student drop-off at this building. That will be done at their location on 13th East. They walk the students down to the building. So the traffic uh, is not really a big concern as far as that is concerned. The city sent out notifications. The community council also did a survey, and they surveyed the block on both sides um, of the street where the building is located. Everyone was totally in favor of the zoning recommendation. They also did some survey on um, 7th and uh, 8th South, and again, it was 100% positive. Um, so, um, you have in your packet a letter from the community council. I am actually here on behalf of Esther Hunter, who is the community council chair, and uh, I wish to note, have you note that letter, which also asks for a positive recommendation. Finally, I'd like to break precedent a little bit and thank Anna for the service she has rendered during the time she's been on the council. Anna recognizes that the most important element in Salt Lake City are the people, uh, the people in the neighborhoods. Fine. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And next will be Kathy Scott, who's here in person. I'm Kathy Scott. I'm a neighbor and longtime property owner and East Central Community Council trustee with a special interest in housing displacement. East Central Community is in complete unanimous support of the McGillis School Douglas Ward property rezone and master plan amendment. The proposal was reviewed by the East Central Community Development and Land Use Committee in light of the master plan, traffic, and existing city plans for the impact and the implications. The committee fully endorsed the proposal. The proposal was distributed to the East Central Community Members pro uh, Propriety email list, which is over 7,000, requesting feedback. Positive comments were received. On August 10th, the proposal was presented to an East Central Community General Membership meeting. At that time, a vote was taken 72 to 0 in favor of the recommendation with no conditions that a positive recommendation be forwarded to the city. The McGillis School has been an excellent neighbor. Over a long period of time, they've preserved, restored, and adapted their buildings. They have shared their facility with the neighborhood in a respectful manner. The school board and administration has displayed thoughtful and sensitive consideration of the preservation of the architectural integrity of the building. East Central Community Council unanimously supports the rezone and hopes that you will too. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Are there any more comments? That was the final registered commenter. Are there any members of the public present that would like to speak to this item? 
All right, seeing none. I... Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that the council close the public hearing and adopt the ordinance. Second. 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 I didn't even ask for a motion yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a motion from uh, Council Member Dugan and a second from Council Member Valdemoros. Yes. Is there any discussion to this motion? It wasn't me this time. All right, seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Enthusiastically aye. <laughs> Any opposed say nay. The motion passes unanimously. Okay. I can say something. I'm. Thank you for your words. Um, I, it's been great to work with the McGillie School and the Central Community Council. So involved and so um, pleasant to work with. And we have made so much progress because we all sat down and talked and talked and go over so many uh, different reiterations of how we could make it happen. And you are a great addition, the McGillie School. Obviously, the neighbors are so pleased to have you there. And I'm so excited that we're keeping that building. And it's for an excellent, excellent um, reason and, and purpose. So congratulations to McGillis. So good luck in closing that deal. Go go knock on their doors right now. Sign it. <laughs> Thank you. And without Councilmember Valdemore asking us to accelerate that, we, we would not have adopted tonight. So um, we are on, that's the last public hearing item. We do later in the agenda have general comment. So stick around if you're here for that. Um, we are now on section C. Section C is potential action items. And this brings us to item C1, which is an ordinance related to subdivision code amendments. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that the council adopt the ordinance. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Pui and a second from Councilmember Petro. Any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. This motion passes unanimously. Item number C2, which is an ordinance regarding a rezone at 2157 South Lincoln Street, is going to be pulled from today's agenda and rescheduled to a future meeting. There's just a little bit more coordination we need to do with the applicant. Um, item C3, this brings us to item C3, which is an ordinance regarding affordable housing incentives. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, Council. I move that the Council adopt the ordinance establishing a chapter for zoning incentives and adding affordable housing incentives in city code. I further move the Council to initiate a legislative action requesting the administration work with the attorney's office to draft an, or draft an ordinance that, one, clarify city code to ensure that construction work does not damage adjacent properties, two, establishes penalties to deter damage from occurring, three, defines a process for the city to effectively enforce city code in situations where damage occurs, and four, outlines a process to remediate situations when damage occurs. I further move the council request that the administration transmit a report to the council outlining the implementation plan to administer and enforce the affordable housing incentives program by April 30th, 2024. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Petro and a second from Councilmember Young. <clears throat> Is there any discussion of this motion? Mr. Chair, just Councilmember Dugan. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I uh, appreciate all the effort and uh, the outreach that went involved, was involved in this ordinance and the discussion that we had at the council level, at the staff level, and at the community level. I showed that, that we had a lot of engagement and a lot of uh, good discussions and uh, robust discussions, and I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate the idea that we made some uh, changes to the, to the ordinance in a, in a positive direction. I like the uh, additions to Councilmember Wharton's uh, for, I would say, the Title 18 uh, building codes uh, changes was added was nice. The changes to the uh, homeownership incentives so that we have boosted our homeownership incentives because homeownership is so important for all of us, and it's vital for a, a healthy city and vital for all communities that, that have home ownership. Um, but I did disagree with the uh, three plex and the four plexes in the single family zones. I was, I'm okay with the two plexes, uh, duplexes, but uh, that was the one thing that I just uh, disagreed with. 
but overall, I think it's a, a good uh, ordinance. I just uh, have a definitive opinion on that one. So thank Thanks, you Councilman Dugan. Thank you, Chair Bray. Uh, Councilman Peter and then Councilman Puy. Thank you. Um, this is another one of those policies that we've had a lot of uh, really vigorous conversation. Um, I want to thank Council Member Dugan, who probably was the most opposite to me in terms of viewpoints on this, for really advocating for intelligent ways to incorporate home ownership into this into this um, statute. You, your advocacy specifically is the one that drove that, and I thank you for it. I think this is a better ordinance for your work. I do want to challenge all of us, constituents and policymakers alike, to learn to have these conversations. We, we did the same thing on ADUs. We can have these conversations without demonizing renters. Renters are not a subpar portion of our citizenry. There's any number of reasons that people rent. They can choose to. The only problem is when people who would choose not to rent are unable to. And our work here is designed, especially now thanks to the influence of Council Member Dugan, to make sure that we are increasing the opportunities for people to choose. But if our city in the course of transition has a shift in dynamics, it would just be incumbent upon us to include renters in ways that they have historically not, be included, not been included. The demonization of them or the characterization, characterization that they care less about the community or that they're not as deeply invested, it simply cannot stand. And we must eliminate it, constituents and policymakers alike, from our vocabulary. I really appreciate, I, I think this is a really good piece. I will be asking for metrics on its success. This is still incumbent upon developers who live in a high interest rate ecosystem taking us up on these offers. And so we know that there's a lot of wild cards here. But this is good work, and it's good work in a right direction. And I'm really excited for both the homeowners and the renters who will benefit from it. Thank you, Council Member Petro. Council Member Pui. I, very quickly, I just wanted to thank everybody um, and, and uh, hear, uh, you know, the council members that, uh, you know, disagreed and, and, and brought it together and, and found common, uh, common ground. And I, you know, this, uh, and we stayed above board, um, even though that people, some people in the community were uh, demonizing density and scaring us um, about this. And it is a big deal. Uh, this ordinance is a big deal for the city, for the future of the city. Uh, density uh, is not a bad word. Uh, sure, we have to mitigate some of the issues related to density, but we need to recognize, and I hope this ordinance uh, shows to the whole state uh, recognize that we are growing and we need to accommodate the growth in a manner that uh, allows for density in other in in all parts of our city. Albeit, it might be gentle density in some parts, um, but you know, density belongs every place in our city. Um, and I want to thank everybody and uh, for torturing the planning department so much and uh, with making all the many changes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for 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 this for bringing this ordinance to this point. So. Oh. I have a, I'm, I'm saving my comment till after. It's not about the motion. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess. I guess. I mean, you can say it whenever you want. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to say mine now. Um, I, uh, I want to just thank everybody for their work on this as well. This is a really long time coming, um, working on this ordinance, and it's, um, I hope, um, and I believe it's going to be one of the things that I'm most proud of having accomplished um, in my time on the council. Um, and for people, I know a lot of people are nervous about it, um, and a lot of people are, are afraid about what changes this might mean for their neighborhood. Um, and I hope that, um, that people that are feeling that way will come um, up to the avenues or come to Marmalade um, and spend some time and see that... Um, having single family homes next to apartments, um, next to condos, next to townhouses, next to historic mansions 
you can have a neighborhood that has all of that um, and still has you know little stores and shops and restaurants that you can walk to and even uh, though the process by which the avenues and the marmalade came to be that kind of neighborhood um, was a quite a bumpy road um, this process I think I think is both a better process and is going to create a similar and better result um, that we are going to be able to have more of that uh, more types of housing diversity and along with that comes income diversity um, and again to the people that are concerned about whether you know renters versus homeowners and how those people are going to care for their neighborhood I mean there are people that have lived and rented in the avenues for you know most of their adult life who've been there longer than I've been alive um, when I was um, or back when I lived in the avenues as a child so um, I think this is a positive thing I think this is a good thing and we've built a lot of uh, metrics and a lot of ways that we can manage this going forward to ensure that we get the outcome that that is that we've designed it for so thanks for everybody's work on this um, thank you for allowing me to include um, and supporting my inclusion of um, this language that also protects adjacent property owners um, I think that I, I spoke on that at length so I won't go into that but I really appreciate um, recognizing that if there is going to be more construction and there are going to be some of these changes to the neighborhood we need to have a clearer process and um, clearer guidelines for protecting the existing residents and their property so that they can be in a, the best possible position to welcome their new neighbors thank you so mr chair Go ahead, so i think this is monumental so first of all thank you for all the to all the council members and staff for um for the discussion and the patience with us uh, as we try to, you know, edit and, and draft this ordinance. Um, this is monumental for Salt Lake City. We're, we're growing. We're finally growing. Um, um, change is coming. It's, it's um, normal. Um, and also, we're tackling the difficult issues that we have today, which is the lack of, um, the lack of uh, homes or units for people to live in. We're tackling... Um, the affordability, the affordability issue, we're tackling the home ownership issue, uh, and, and we're tackling the, the things that we heard from the neighbors, which were not related to this, but we um, have been proactive in that sense. Uh, what, you know, we know we're growing and what's going to happen when potentially some structures may damage. The city needs to have an answer for that, and I'm so glad that it's here so that we can prevent and have some remedies for that. Um, District 4, it's no stranger to renters uh, or to growth or to <laughs> multiple people living in, in, you know, in, a, in a unit. So um, that was not the issue, I feel, in terms of um, homeownership or rentals. Uh, I think District 4 welcomes it and it's excited Obviously, there are some things that people might be a little iffy about it, but overall, I think it's a great, great outcome. So also one of the biggest things, um, one of the proudest things I've done in the council this past five years. So thank you. Thank you so much, council members. I will call the question. The motion was made by council member Peacher on the second by council member Young. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Nay. That motion passes six to one with Councilmember Dugan in the opposition. And I just want to take a very, very short moment of personal privilege and just say thank you personally to all of my council colleagues, as well as staff, both council staff and administrative staff. Passing this while I was chair is one of, was one of my biggest goals, this along with thriving in place. And there were times when it didn't seem like the timing was going to work out for us to do this, and I know mountains were moved, and council members were able were made concessions, and though we didn't get to a hundred percent consensus, I feel really proud of where we got, um, and the things that we were able to include in this, because of the robust discussion, um, but still able to get it done this year. So thank you, personally, to staff and everybody that's been involved. All right, we are moving on to item C4. <clears throat> C4 is an ordinance regarding form-based urban neighborhood zoning text amendments as uh, related to the fleet block rezone and public square designation. I will look for a motion. 
Mr. Chair. Councilor Puy. I move that the council adopt the or ordinance that one establishes the form based mixed use 11 zoning district and rezones and two rezones the fleet block to form based mixed use 11. I further move that the council adopt an ordinance that establishes the southeast portion of the block as a public square in Title 15, pursuant to the boundaries included in the ordinance. I further move that the council adopt a legislative action requiring a reg restrictive covenant be recorded against the property that identifies the area of the fleet block as a public square. Do I have a second? I have a, a motion from council member Pui and second from council member Valdemoros. Is there any discussion to that motion? Mr. Chair. Yeah. Who was that? Councilman Pui? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, uh, again, this is a big deal. Uh, we, the administration worked uh, with, uh, for, you know, many, many months uh, to incorporate uh, the vision of the community uh, on this square um, to to meet all of these uh, desires uh, and and to also bring a public good to the community. Um, you know, this building that's been almost abandoned for a long time that is not given to the community uh, could and will um, after all of that intensive uh, engagement, uh, public feedback. Uh, and sessions that the administration held where the community, uh, with different members of the community and different groups. Uh, it is beautiful to see that we are creating an open space in this, uh, in this area. Uh, it is beautiful to see that many of those uh, that had something to say are going to see their input in place in this uh, square. Um, so I, I'm very proud uh, of the work that the city did uh to make this happen so this is a big deal thank you councilman Pui. any other comments to this motion all right all those uh seeing none i'll call the question all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any aye. opposed say nay the that post that passes unanimously um we are, that is the final item in this section of the agenda. So we are now on to section D, which is comments. The first item is D1, which are questions to the mayor from the city council. Rachel Otto, mayor, chief of staff, is attending tonight's meeting on behalf of Mayor Mendenhall, who could not be here. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Council members, are there any uh, questions or comments to the mayor or, or uh, mayor's administration? Seeing none, we will move on to item D2, which is comments to the city council. This is the general comment section of our agenda where members of the public can speak to us on any item that was not on one of the public hearing items before, before, previously in the meeting. As a reminder to those joining in Zoom, Achintia Mahajun from our staff is going to moderate the Zoom window and we'll message you with any questions about your registration. Staff is handling many tasks, so limit messages to Achintia to technical issues and minimal informational updates. If you do need to speak with our staff, um, you can also select Scott Corpany from the list of participants, and you can as well as raise your hand in the Zoom uh, window to indicate that you need something from the host. Taylor Hill, another staff member, will be calling the names of those who wish to comment based on order of registration or receive comment card. If you are on Zoom, please unmute your mic when Taylor calls your name. If you're here in person, please come to the podium. At the two minute mark, the host will announce time and your microphone will be muted. If you're unable to finish your comments, please send the rest via email, mail, or call our office. Um, as a reminder, the rules of decorum apply here as well, which are basically to be respectful of all points of view. Uh, and as such, we ask that there be no applause or yelling or cheering, um, no profanity, racial slurs, or obscene or defamatory remarks, et cetera. Uh, if you violate this rule, you, we will mute your microphone and you'll forfeit your chance to address the council tonight. The, Taylor, please call, start with our first general comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have eight people registered for general comment. The first will be Levy Woodruff, followed by Ray Duckworth, and then Tim Dwyer. Levy is here in person. 
Good evening, uh, Council Members. My name is Levy Woodruff, and I'm just here speaking on my own behalf as a citizen. Uh, and I would like to comment on the Fleet Block rezone, um, the ordinance which, which was just passed unanimously a moment ago. Um, the first thing I'd like to observe is that I've read the city's proposals and discussions um, that you've put on the public website about the Fleet Block redevelopment. And those proposals do not include a definite commitment to ensuring that the block's future use supports community needs and especially honors the wishes of those families who lost loved ones to police brutality and whose loved ones are currently memorialized in the murals on the block's buildings. What I have noticed in those uh, proposals is repeated mentions of potential commercial redevelopment of the space. The city did a study of gentrification and that very study concluded that there are no more affordable neighborhoods that someone could move to if they are priced out of their own neighborhood by redevelopment and gentrification. The Granary District, where the Fleet Block is, is currently undergoing a lot of business development. And while I definitely am in favor of local businesses, growth means that there will be people who are priced out of their homes as the area becomes more expensive. Fleet Block is right there. That space could and should be used to help those residents who are struggling with high costs of housing and food. Maybe a non-congregate emergency shelter, maybe permanent supportive housing, maybe a food pantry. The community around the Fleet Block should ultimately have a say on what it's used for. But I have to say, it seems like bad faith to invite public input, hear from families and community members who say that they want their loved ones' memorials to be preserved, and they want that space to be used for public good, and then to have official proposals that continue to emphasize potential reuse that sounds like the mixed housing and retail developments that are already everywhere in Salt Lake City and that rent for 1200 to 1300 a month for a one bedroom. That's not exactly affordable housing. Fine. Thank you. Next will be Ray Duckworth, followed by Tim Dwyer and then Karina McQuillan. Ray, you may now unmute. Hi, my name is Ray Duckworth and my cousin is Bobby Duckworth. He is depicted on the murals in Fleet Block. Uh, my comments are directed towards the decision for Fleet Block. <clears throat> there is a high priority to house people in Salt Lake City. Um, it is unfortunate that the space is being utilized as if that is an actual concern or a priority on this administration's table. Um, as a family member of someone who lost someone to police brutality that's depicted on the space, I know that in the current position I'm in, I would not be able to afford the quote affordable housing that they are working to describe for this space. Um, I also want the public to know that within the conversations with the families of police brutality, the families have done nothing but amplify a request to preserve this space, keep this space safe and sacred so we can continue healing and unifying the community members in Salt Lake City. Um, it's sad that the administration has never acknowledged that or supported that idea from these families who've lost someone. I also want to let everyone know that the mayor actually responded to an email today and she describes this area to be a negative in a negative light. Um, it's negative to her because we're talking about her not holding anyone accountable for their actions. We wouldn't have to have a space like this with police brutality family members depicted on them if you didn't just fight, you could have just fired killer cops. And then we wouldn't have to even have an area like this that we're working so hard to preserve and keep a center space for the community. Fine. Next will be Tim Dwyer, followed by Karina McClellan, and then Cindy Cromer. Tim, you may now unmute. Hi, I really appreciate the comments that were just shared by community members. Um, I'm calling in on behalf of both uh, a business owner that's next to the fleet block and also as co-chair or vice chair of the Greenery District Alliance. Um, and I do applaud that the city has uh, is part of the plan with seat fleet block here is to maintain the public space uh, and codifying that really does give a huge opportunity to 
um, create a shared uh, public environment that benefits folks who will be both living and working in the area. Um, this is something that the district has been, or the alliance that I'm a part of has been advocating for for some time. And it's really great to see um, that that part of our uh, push for green space and public space has been heated. Um, I also do see that the, the city has a big responsibility to uphold um, you know, the, the murals and, um, you know, what this means to the community now um, in its current form. Um, and I really hope that uh, going forward with the, the, the proposals for this park and the details of that do honor the community in the fullest sense, um, both for what it has become um, and what it means and what it can uh, do to continue to support the community in and around Fleet Block. Um, we do have some concerns still with uh, the lack of uh, parking considerations, and that's been voiced uh, uh, from several different aspects uh, related to the development there, especially if we're looking at large scale. Um, we definitely don't want to create uh, a street parking crisis like we have in um, uh, the Central Ninth area. Uh, so any sort of housing should have some uh, important considerations for parking. Um, but ultimately, I think we like to see what's happening with Fleet Block and certainly applaud the city's uh, promotion of the public and green spaces. And next will be Karina McClellan, followed by Cindy Cromer and then Christina Robb. Karina is here in person. Hi, my name is Karina and I'm with the Work Activity Center. We are a nonprofit that serves adults with disabilities. And I am basically here just for community awareness. We've been in business for 65 years and I'm consistently hearing that people weren't aware of our services. So I wanted to come to the meeting today just to make it known of who we are and what we offer. Um, our, in our uh, center, we offer uh, a day program, a residential program, as well as an employment program. In our day program, we work on like social skills and working on coordination and tactical skills, journaling, book club. We have a beautiful courtyard where we work on gardening and bocce ball out there, as well as uh, adaptive outdoor fitness and exercise. We have also an indoor adaptive exercise um, facility, and it's the only one in the state of Utah that is not attached to a hospital. We have an amazing creative arts department where we host an annual art show every year. And this past September, we had 69 pieces of art that were amazing pieces. We've got really masterful creations that come out of our center. In our residential program, we have four properties. The two are in South Salt Lake and we do have openings currently in our residential program. In that program, we support daily living skills, grocery shopping, community activities, as well as financial and medical case support. Our employment services department is located in Salt Lake as well. And there we work with employment preparation and job coaching and supportive employment, working alongside with Volk Rehab and um, trying to get some of our clients out to work. And I'll finally, we partner with UTA for transportation to get all of our folks to and from appointments and various things. And we have a large focus on community inclusion activities. And that's it. Thank you. Next will be Cindy Cromer, followed by Christina Robb, and then Alana Raskind. Cindy is here in person. My name is still Cindy Cromer. I'm making an end of the year request regarding nominations to the city's boards and commissions. I'm going to put the request right up front and then explain why I think it's so important. I'm asking that in 2024, all nominees to the city's boards and commissions sign a statement that they have read and support the authority of the board or commission as stated in the ordinance. This afternoon, I sent you a copy of 21A.06.030 which states the authority of the city's planning commission. It is very clear in the ordinance that the planning commission does not set policy, except as related to its own operation. Contrary to a recent statement, the commissioners do have the authority to initiate petitions, although the current members have rarely used it. 
The commissioners make recommendations, make decisions on specific administration matters, and hear appeals. These actions are rarely based on economics. Commissioners do not have the authority to ensure that their colleagues or business partners are selected for the commission, although I could tell you a story about that. I will close by stating that the commissioner's personal opinions are largely irrelevant to the task of making recommendations and administrative decisions. The most important qualities in a commissioner are appreciation of our adopted ordinances, respect for the public engagement which contributed to those ordinances, and the initiative to propose changes to ordinances which are not accomplishing the shared vision we have for the city. As always, I am willing to talk to you individually or with your staff about this suggestion. Thank you. And next will be Christina Robb, followed by Alana Raskind, and then Wendy Garvin. Christina is here in person. Hello, my name is Christina Robb, and I currently represent the East Liberty Park Community Organization as chair. I am also a renter. Um, it's been really exciting to work with my particular community counselor as a renter and to increase the diversity of our community council to understand the needs as well as um, of renters as well as those as folks who own property and reside in Alpco. Um, I wanted to thank the council for really um, listening to us regarding the affordable housing um, initiative slash overlay. All the way through the process, um, we felt like you were hearing us as we made um, suggestions about stratifying the um, the ordinance to reflect more detail. Um, our community council wrote this at the beginning of the process. While this proposal does incentivize just density, density on its own does not necessitate affordability. Without safeguards, data collection, and enforcement for affordable units, density is simply an act for its own sake and further displaces renters at lower price points due to demolition of lower value units in favor of higher priced, more densely packed units. And further in the process, we can't thank you enough for the struggles you went through to come up with um, an ordinance that does indeed, in our opinion, provide safeguards, data collection, and enforcement opportunities to actually incentivize affordability in Salt Lake City. Thank you. Next will be Ilana Raskin, followed by Wendy Garvin. Ilana, you may now unmute. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ilana Raskin. I'm here to comment on the fleet block rezone. Um, I and I know many others who are here tonight spoke at the public hearing in September um, on this issue. And as far as I can tell, as others have already said, there really haven't been any good faith efforts to address the concerns raised by community members, particularly the family members and loved ones of the individuals who are memorialized on the murals. Um, and while many community members, myself included, appreciate the designation of a public square, uh, the family members of those represented in the murals, who I don't speak for, but whose words I hope to amplify, have repeatedly asked for the space to be used to provide vital services to our community, including truly affordable housing, mental health services, child care, public health services, affordable, healthy food, and many other resources. And my question tonight is why have the mayor's office and city council not committed to taking action on these requests? If the answer is that there's too much money to be made from commercial development, I would respectfully request that you simply say that, repeatedly saying to the community that you are listening to the families and listening to community members without any real action to back up your words is disingenuous and erodes the already limited trust between constituents and elected officials. So after tonight, as the development of Fleet Block enters a new phase, I sincerely hope that you seek to rectify the harms that have already been done and actively commit to creating a space that truly serves the needs of the community. Thank you. And next will be Wendy Garvin, who's here in person. Hi folks, I know you're all so happy to see me here again. Um, I'm here to speak to a very disturbing news article from last week. This article stated that there is an oversupply of market rate and luxury housing in Salt Lake City right now. 
And what that means is that there are these tall buildings all over the city that are heated and empty while people are literally dying in their shadow. That is utterly unacceptable. I understand that you have limitations as a city council. I understand that the legislature has not been helpful in this area. And I challenge anyone who has any influence with the legislature to help us with that. But there is more you can do. The city has lobbyists. You could be, you could be lobbying to change the ban on inclusionary zoning. You could be lobbying to put temporary rent caps in place, but what we cannot do is give up and say that we can't do anything because people's lives are at stake. And that harms not only those people who are experiencing homelessness, but we as a society who walk past them while they suffer. I know that we can do better. And the next season that's coming up is the city budget. And I expect to see big investments in housing, in shelters, in programs, in anything that will help with homelessness. I understand that this is hard. I understand that we've been asking the state to step up, but they just the governor just offered a really nice budget where they are taking the responsibility that they need to. And I need to see Salt Lake City match, match that effort and match the work that the state is putting in. Because right now, Salt Lake City is behind. And and I am tired of hearing that it's not our problem and that other people need to step up. These people live in Salt Lake City, they've chosen Salt Lake City, and Salt Lake City has a responsibility to address this growing homelessness crisis. And so as Hi. the budgeting season comes, I really hope to see changes. That was the final registered commenter. Is there anybody else in the audience that did not register, but would like to provide general comment tonight. All right, seeing then we will close the general comment period <clears throat> and move on to section E. Section E is new business, and item E1 is related to a resolution rectifying, recertifying the Salt Lake City Justice Court. Mr. Chair. Um, I move that the council adopt a resolution requesting the recertification of the Salt Lake City Justice Court by the Board of Justice Court Judges and the Utah Judicial Council. Second. Okay, I have a motion from Councilmember Wharton and a second from Councilmember Dugan. Is there any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion passes unanimously. Item... Okay, that's all, everything in item section E. So section F is unfinished business. We are now on I, section F1. F1 is an ordinance related to local business direct assistance ARPA grant awards. Chair, I move that the council adopt an ordinance approving the American Rescue Plan Act local business district direct assistance grant awards and contingency as shown in exhibit A funding log. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Petro and a second from Councilmember Dugan. Is there any discussion of this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion passes unanimously. Item F2 is a resolution about local nonprofit direct assistance grant awards. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt a resolution approving the local nonprofit direct assistance grant awards and contingency as shown in the Exhibit A funding log. Second. Motion comes from Councilor Dugan with a second by Councilmember Young. Is there any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we are on item F3. F3 is an ordinance approving an economic development revolving loan fund to the Ocean City Seafood Market. I will look for a motion. I move that the council adopt the ordinance approving a $90,000 loan for Ocean City Seafood Market from the Economic Development Loan Fund. Second. Motion from Councilor Petro, second from Councilor Wharton. Is there any discussion of this motion? Um, I'll just say I'm 
always excited for a new Asian food market to come in my neighborhood. And it happens to be at a place where I have a really vivid memory of eating Mongolian barbecue way back when I was in college. So nice. glad that I'll be able to get some more Asian food from the same place. Um, okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion passes unanimously. That brings us to the final section of our agenda, which is the consent portion. I will look for a motion. Move for approval. Second. Motion by Council Member Wharton and second by Council Member Dugan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. We are adjourned. <laughs>